My name is Hao Zhang. First, I would like to thank the conference organizer to give me such a good opportunity to, to talk about the Smaranas in semiconductor nanowires and also our research in Delft. Uh, I'm a postdoc in uh, Leo Common Homes Group. And um, so the title is uh, Maranas in Semiconductor Nanowires. And uh, if you look at the title, there's nothing about the superconductor, while the conference title is uh, Superconducting Devices. And, uh, but actually, we do have superconductor. Actually, we put superconductor on top of semiconductor nanowires. So these two are two examples of the uh, cross-section of our device. So this uh, hexagonal shape is a semiconductor nanowire, indium-2 nanowire. And this is an albium-based superconductor. While this one is a semiconductor nanowire with an aluminum superconductor. And uh, the title also has an interface here. Actually, the interface plays a very important role in this, uh, in this field. Actually, I will show you that all the good results that we can get is due to this good interface between superconductor and semiconductor. And all the bad results are because we originally had uh, very bad interfaces. So the, the, the transport was done uh, in Delft and uh, with uh, four PhD students, Dee, Yuri, Mikhail, and Ander, and two master students, Guan and Nick. Uh, the serial simulation was, uh, we collaborated with the uh, Maryland group, uh, Darsama's group, uh, on uh, most of the Maryland simulations. And our nanowires uh, were grown by uh, Andoman team and also Santa Barbara team together. Andoman team is uh, Eric Barker's team and Santa Barbara Chris Thompson team. And we are funded by uh, Microsoft Station Q. Um, yeah, that's all. So a very brief introduction about uh, this field. Uh, this, this field actually was started in 2010 uh, by two theory groups, uh, Dasama's group and uh, also uh, this, uh, this, uh, term, uh, this group. Uh, so they, they, start, they, they start come up with this uh, one-dimensional uh, Maranana Hamiltonian. And if you look at the Hamiltonian, it's, uh, it's very simple, actually. So uh, this part is basically a one-dimensional nanowire. And uh, this alpha r is the uh, spin orbit interaction. So uh, the, the nanowire has a strong spin orbit interaction. And this part is a Zeeman energy term, which you just need to remind you. And the last part is a, a superconductivity part. You have a pair potential delta here. So the theory predicts that if the uh, Zeeman energy is larger than this uh, chemical potential mu square plus the uh, gap delta square, then you can drive this uh, one-dimensional superconductor into a effectively a P-wave superconductor. And uh, in the end, the, uh, the, the two Marana uh, bound state will be localized at the end of this, uh, this uh, superconductor. So experimentally, what we want to do is to uh, engineer such a Hamiltonian in our system. So we, we start, first start with a nanowire, which has a strong spin orbit coupling, uh, which is basically the first term here. And for our case, it's the indium tin nanowire. Then we uh, have the third term, a superconductor. So we just put a superconductor on top of the nanowire to make the nanowire superconducting. And then uh, we apply magnetic field to create the second term. Now we have all these uh, ingredients which is needed to create such a Hamiltonian. And as long as your magnetic field or zeeman energy is larger than this value, you can create uh, two maranas at the end of the uh, 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 superconductor. And to detect these two maranas, we need to add the uh, gate and contacts. So we have uh, two gates uh, underneath the nanowire and a contact here. So we use this narrow gate to create a tunnel barrier to deplete this wire. And then we mirror the conductance from uh, this contact to this contact. Because the marana is zero energy, so we should mirror some signal at zero uh, energy uh, if you apply a zero bias voltage across these uh, two contacts. And this gate only tunes the chemical potential underneath the nanowire because we have this condition. So we have to make sure that the uh, chemical potential is small enough so that the energy is larger than this term. So we only have two gates, one gate to the tun uh, tunnel barrier and the other gate to tune the chemical potential. Uh, and then uh, if we look at the uh, energy uh, spectrum, so if we start with the nanowire, it's basically, because it's one dimensional, so it's basically a parabola, energy versus momentum, and the spin generates. And now if you add uh, uh, spin orbit coupling into uh, uh, this system, what it does is that for Rush bar spin orbit coupling, it just splits the uh, spin generator subband to left and right. And this splitting is the, uh, the, the, the is a proportional to the strength of the spin orbit coupling. And then we add the superconductor. So what does superconductor do is that it first creates, uh, it gives you this so-called particle core symmetry. So basically, all this band will be mirrored around zero energy, at zero energy. So, and then it opens a gap at uh, Fermi energy. 
So in the end, the special will look like this. So you just uh, first do particle core symmetry and uh, uh, give a mirror of this energy structure and then you open a gap, okay? Uh, so then you apply magnetic fields. Uh, what it does is that magnetic field uh, destroy this degeneracy uh, point at this uh, at this point. So basically, uh, this uh, lower blue band will move down, and the upper blue band will move up. We only care about the uh, lower uh, blue band, and here the, the same case. So finally, as your fields keep increasing, these two bands will touch each other. And now here, as your uh, as your Tesla, you see there's a gap in your fermion energy, and now the gap closes. And then if you continue to increase the magnetic field, uh, this gap reopens. And uh, this gap is what we call the topological gap. So now it's, it's an inverted gap. The gap is, is negative. Okay. Uh, this is the uh, momentum space. Now if we look at the real space, uh, at this region where you, uh, your magnetic field is larger than critical field, then you are in the inverted band regime. And uh, in, the, in this part, the band is inverted, and outside is normal. So it looks like the, uh, if you, if you um, compare to the conventional semiconductor language, <coughs> your valence band now goes to the conduction band, and the conduction band goes to the valence band. And here the band is inverted. And at the end, they have to cross each other, and they cross at zero, because you have particle core symmetry. Okay? So it's guaranteed that they cross at zero. And the, the crossing point is where you create uh, this Marana bound state. And because of particle core symmetry, the energy is always zero. And because it has to close as the, as the two ends, so that's why it's always uh, coming in pairs, localized as the two ends. So to, to detect this uh, Marana bound state, uh, as I said, we add a contact and measure the conductance. So this is the energy spectrum. Left side is the, uh, the normal conduct, it's just a regular Fermi C. And right side is the topological semiconductor part. And you can see it's gapped out, and in the middle there is a, a Marana bound state. So if we pass a current from left to right through this tunnel barrier, then you will find that when the bias is zero, aligned with the Marana energy, uh, then you have an excess current. So current is increased. And uh, in terms of uh, differential conductance, di over dv, you will see a conductance enhancement that will give you your conductance peak. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the, what, we, what you should observe, uh, a zero bias conductance peak. because. Di over dv now uh, in the tunnel regime is proportional to the tensor state. And because you have a tensor state at zero, so you have a, you have a di dv at zero energy. So if, if you increase the Zeeman field here, so this is a, a, a very typical uh, uh, behavior from, uh, from theory. Uh, so if you increase the magnetic field, Zeeman energy, and you can see at zero field, field, there's a gap inside. The color is the conductance, by the way. And blue is zero conductance, means no state. Okay. And at zero, at zero magnetic field, you see that there's no state here, which means it's gapped. This is a superconducting gap. And when you increase the magnetic field, some state comes down. And uh, this is what we call the gap closing. And after the gap closes, you see the gap reopens, because uh, all the states get repelled except one merge at zero. And this zero state is basically the Marana state. And this gap now is the uh, correspond to the topological gap. Okay. So the gap closes and reopens, and the Marana appears. And this reopening gap is the topological gap, which gives you the topological protection. And the topological protection basically means that as long as we don't close this uh, topological gap, you always have two Maranas well localized at the end. And it's uh, robust against the fluctuations, for example, disorders here. As long as the disorder is not so much that it doesn't close the gap, you always have two Maranas. And this gives you a topological protection. OK, so uh, experimentally, uh, okay, our DELFS group first uh, tried to measure such a zero bias conductance peak in the system. So this is the device, uh, the first generation device. Uh, you have a nanowire, an individual nanowire, contact with a superconductor. This superconductor is a, an albium based superconductor. And then we add a normal contact here, and all the bottom gates are here. So you use this uh, green gate to create a tunnel barrier in front of the superconductor, and you detect the denser state after this tunnel barrier by mirroring the conductance from the normal contact N to the superconducting contact S. So you mirror the conductance from N to S as a function of bias voltage, and then you increase the magnetic fields. So different curve represents different fields. At zero Tesla, you see a deep structure here. So this, this, this structure corresponds to the superconducting gap. And then when you increase the magnetic field, you find a zero bias conductance peak starts to show up. Okay, so this is the first signature uh, that we detect in the uh, Marana nanowires. 
And then uh, this, this color map is basically the same data with uh, this uh, waterfall plot. And x axis is minus field, and then this is bias voltage. So at zero field, you see there's a gap, and when you increase field, there's a zero bias condensation peak here. And for the rest of the talk, uh, I will mainly focus on this, uh, this kind of uh, color plot. Uh, so right after the DevOps work, there are a lot of work on this, uh, in this field. Actually, there are uh, these uh, 10 papers at least this is what I know. Uh, 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 observed Marana's, uh, uh, observed zero bias peaks in this Marana nanowires and claim Marana's. Uh, but if we look at the, to the de detail of uh, uh, all this data, uh, I mean, th this seems mounting evidence. But uh, th this Marana field is uh, still quite uh, controversial. There are a lot of debate and whether this is true Marana or other stuff. Uh, why is that? Okay. Uh, first, there are a lot of alternatives which proposed, and this alternative can give you a uh, zero bias peak, which are not Maranas, but also present pre in the system. And also the uh, most important is that the Marana predictions is not observed. <laughs> For example, the, the Marana uh, zero bias peak height should be quantized, and, uh, and the, actually the, the height here is only 5% of that uh, predicted value. So this is a huge discrepancy. And I will discuss these two parts in the rest of my, uh, my talk. This is the outline. Uh, I will, for the first part, alternative, I will first discuss, be because most of the alternatives are due to uh, disorders in the system, I will discuss how do we try to eliminate disorders, and then finally we can get to the ballistic wires. And the first second part is about this, uh, this uh, quantized zero bias peak height. And uh, th this is done in actually a new system which we did. Uh, it gives you hard gap and uh, also uh, a lot of uh, quantized zero bias peaks, but also a lot of uh, trivial zero bias peaks which are due to, for example, Andrew Von Steen in this system. And I'll uh, have a detailed discussion about this. The third part, I would, uh, if I, if I had, have time, uh, I would discuss this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, non-abelian stuff and uh, Marana qubit that we are trying to do. We haven't done so yet, but uh, we have some preliminary work in this. But I will probably not have time to discuss the third part. And, uh, but uh, the first part and second part will be uh, the main part of my talk. Uh, so first, this uh, ballistic versus disorder alternatives. And these are the four most important alternatives, I, that I think, in this field. Uh, the first two are two experimental work from uh, Professor De Franceschi's group. Uh, the later two are the two theory work. So uh, the first one, uh, so they are both done in this uh, uh, semiconductor nanowires coupled to a superconductor. Okay? And the first one is a uh, Connell effect. So if you have disorders in the nanowire, and you can create uh, some localized state and give you localized spin. And then the normal metal, will, uh, the lead, will try to screen the spin. And when you increase the magnetic field, you kill the superconductivity, and you create a lot of quartz particles. And these quartz particles can try to screen the spin, give you a condo zero bias peak. So this, this is uh, basically very similar to the mana signature. At zero Tesla, you don't have zero bias peaks. At the final magnetic field, you create some zero bias peaks. Okay? And this part is the, uh, I will talk in detail later, uh, Andrew Bond state. So you, uh, again, due to disorder, if you have a localized uh, uh, state and you also have superconductivity, then it's the state becomes energy bound state. And when you apply magnetic field, this uh, spinful energy bound state will split due to Zeeman energy, and then they will merge as zero from a zero bias peak. The third one is due to uh, purely due to disorder. After you apply magnetic field, you kill the superconductivity, then you have a cluster of uh, denser state around zero energy. And then after thermal broadening or other broadening mechanism, this denser state uh, from the zero bias peak. And the last one is due to uh, weak anti-localization. Uh, uh, by the name, you know anti-localization is basically due to disorder. Okay. So uh, to sum up, basically all these uh, four alternatives can sort of be related to disorders. And uh, where does the disorder come from in our system? So uh, the disorder in our system actually comes from the interface. This is the ideal device that you want to have. A semiconductor nanowire has a superconductor on top and the normal metal on top, and the interface is very flat. But the actual device looks like this. Okay. And uh, to get rid of this disorder, we really have to do this uh, interface engineer, try to get cleaner and better interfaces between the superconductor and the semiconductor. And why do we have to create uh, this kind of uh, uh, junks? Because our nanowire has surface oxide. Okay? And if you directly put superconductor on the nanowire, uh, of course, the interface is flat. But then, because of this uh, five nanometer thick surface oxide, it's insulated, and you don't see this superconductivity, and you don't measure any conductance. And you have to get rid of these uh, surface oxides, 
And then what we initially did is trying to use a, a argon bombarding. So we uh, accelerate an argon atom to bombard on the nanowire surface to kick off all these uh, oxides. But this is a, a very aggressive physical etching. And it al also damages the crystal uh, in the semiconductor nanowire. And if you look at the nanowire, so this part is before the argon etching, and this part is after argon etching. And you can see almost uh, one third of nanowire is etched. And on the third interface, you have a lot of uh, disorders, a lot of junk. And this can cause uh, all these uh, possible uh, alternatives. And what we, uh, and if you have a, a vert uh, vertical line cut, you can see between the nanowire and the superconductor, the interface is also very rough. So what we did is, uh, uh, is trying to use a more gentle method to, to get rid of the oxide. And uh, instead of using physical etching, we use a uh, selective uh, chemical etching. And that only selective etches away the uh, uh, nanowire oxide. And the interface between the nanowire and the superconductor is, you can see, almost atomic flat. And this is also the interface. You can see it's, it's quite flat. Okay. And uh, after this uh, uh, gentle chemical etching, indeed, our transport signature gets uh, improved a lot. So this is a, a normal contact, a nanowire contacted by two normal metal. And we have a baggage, global baggage underneath to deplete this uh, nano, uh, narrow constriction part. Now it's effectively like a quantum point contact. And then we mirror the conductance from this metal to this metal through this nanowire as a function of gate. And when the gate is very negative, the conductance is zero. And when the gate is uh, positive, you populate more subband in this standard construction. Once you populate one subband, the conductance gets uh, quantized as 2 e square of h. And when you populate 2, it becomes uh, 4 e square of h. So this is uh, the regular ballistic quantum point contact picture where you have uh, quantized conductance plateaus. This basically indicates that the the transport through this uh, system is ballistic. There's no disorder. And uh, before, our device looks like this. Okay. And uh, there's no plateau, because of disorder uh, get, give you a lot of uh, backscattering. It's the QZ uh, plateau. And there's a lot of conductance resonances due to disorders. Okay. From here to here, we believe that uh, we actually uh, clean up most of the disorders in the normal context. And the same case for the superconducting context. Now we replace one normal contact with a superconducting contact. Now it's a normal nanowire superconductor system. And this, is, this was the uh, first generation, uh, the, the device of fir the first generation device. And this is the second generation after we use this uh, gentle uh, chemical uh, cleaning. Uh, you can see this is conductance as a function of bias and gate, conductance as a function of bias. And this is the line cut, horizontal line cut. And you can see, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, conductance resonances, this disorder, and no plateau. And here, outside the gap, which is effectively a normal state, n nanowire n, so you resolve this black curve, which gives you a quantized conductance at 2 square of h, and there is no resonances. So, and from here to here, we believe we also clean up this, uh, this uh, disorders uh, a lot uh, in the superconducting context. And now what we need to do is just to apply our magnetic field and tune chemical potential and try to look for zero bias peaks. Again, this is the first generation device, and this is the, what we have now. Uh, you, if you increase the amount of field, you can see the gap closes and form a very robust, stable uh, zero bias peaks. And this, the signature is actually cleaner than this. And this is a simulation from a uh, Maryland group where they uh, took our device, uh, all the geometry uh, and all the spin orbit coupling, all the parameters, and tried to simulate, assume no disorder. And they, this quality agrees with uh, our data, actually. Uh, so the, uh, the, the whole story uh, of the, all the previous work is that uh, disorder in this system can really mimic Maranas and give you zero bias peaks, which are not Maranas. And we uh, really try a lot to uh, eliminate the, this uh, disorder, clean up the disorder a lot. And then in the end, our Marana signatures uh, get actually cleaner and stronger. So I would say this is very highly unlikely that our zero bias peaks can be due to all these disorder effects. But, but there, there are still problems in this field, because uh, if you look at the line cut from the previous slide, this one, as zero, zero Tesla and also a finite magnetic field when you have zero bias peaks. If you look at line cut uh, as zero Tesla, which is the blue curve, the gap is sort of hard, and the conductance inside the gap is almost zero. But when you apply magnetic field to create a, a zero bias peak, you can see inside the gap, uh, the conductance is the finite. And this is uh, the so-called soft gap problem. So when we have zero bias peak, the gap becomes soft. 
And the soft gap basically means there's no gap. And there's coarse particles inside the gap, there's no gap. And no gap means uh, no topological protection. Then even if you can detect Marana zero bias peaks, these Maranas cannot be used for this, this uh, bridging or this, or this uh, uh, topological quantum computing because there's no gap, no, pr no protection. So, uh, and we think that uh, the reason that we have this uh, soft gap when you have zero bias peak is because of the superconductor we use. The superconductor is a Navium based superconductor and it's a type two superconductor. At a very tiny small magnetic field, you can create a lot of vortex. And this vortex can give you a lot of uh, coarse particle tensor state inside the gap. And actually, if you look at the uh, simulation here, uh, they have to assume a dissipation term in their model to make it fit to our data. And this dissipation actually is can well be from the uh, vortex in our system, because the vortex can give you coarse particles and can give you dissipation. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's why we switch uh, our superconductor from niobium titanitride to aluminum, because aluminum is type one superconductor and it doesn't have vortex, should give you hard gap if you as, uh, when you have zero bias peaks. And then that comes to the second part of my talk. So we are trying to solve this uh, hard gap versus soft gap problem and uh, trying to uh, make a, uh, uh, use a different superconductor, aluminum. And uh, actually this aluminum was uh, first used by Copenhagen, Charlie Marcus group and also Peter Cockstrop. Uh, they really did a really nice work uh, trying to make uh, uh, aluminum uh, on top of uh, indium arsenide nanowires. So if you remember, in previously we tried to get rid of the surface oxide to put our superconductor on. And uh, in their case, they don't have uh, oxide at the beginning. So they grow indium arsenide nanowires in the MBE chamber. And without breaking the vacuum, then you don't have the oxide. After, after growing the nanowire, they directly put the aluminum on, the, on top of the nanowire. Then there's no surface oxide. And if you look at the interface, it's really atomic flat between aluminum and the indium antimony nanowires. And uh, indeed, they observe a very hard superconducting gap, this uh, blue curve. And the uh, subgap conductance really reaches zero. Okay. Uh, and uh, after this, they indeed observe very nice uh, uh, Marana signatures, uh, zero bias peaks. So this is the device. Uh, you have an indium arsenide nanowire coupled, uh, with covered with the aluminum shell uh, here. And here, this part, you don't have aluminum. And you use gate to create a quantum dot. <laughs> and you observe this uh, Coulomb blockade of this quantum dot. This is gate and this is bias. This is one Coulomb diamond. And these horizontal lines are the superconducting gap. Uh, and then you uh, use the levels in the dot to probe the Marana state in the nanowire. Okay. So this dot is like a tunnel barrier for our case. And uh, so, and then the increased magnetic fields observe very uh, nice, uh, stable zero bias peaks. This is a very beautiful data. Uh, so you can see the gap closes, and uh, ZBP stays robust more than one Tesla. And if you look at line cuts, when you have zero bias peaks, the gap also looks hard. Okay, this is one Tesla. But uh, uh, there, there's still problems for this uh, system. Uh, because you have uh, quantum dots now, and uh, as I mentioned before, when you have quantum dots, you can have condo or Andre bond state and all these uh, alternatives. So then you open the window for this, uh, all these alternative behaviors, which you have to rule out. And another thing is that the peak height is still very low. If you look at the peak height here, it's still less than 5% of 2e square of h. And it's OK to have low peak height, because uh, if you have thermal broaden effect at finite temperature, then you can bring down the zero bias peak from 2e square of h to very low value. But in that case, your peak width, the peak full width half maximum, should be thermal broaden width. And if you look at this width here, actually it's wider than some border, uh, more than a factor of two wider than some border, 3.5 kVT. Okay? But even if it's wider, it's okay. Because for our system, uh, the Navium Tanar system, this width is also wider than 3.5 kVT. But uh, we know that uh, we have soft gap and we have vortex. And this uh, vortex can give you another broadening mechanism due to dissipation. Okay? So dissipation also plays a similar role uh, like temperature. Okay, so that's why we, we think our zero bias is uh, bring down by dissipation and uh, also uh, temporal uh, temporal burden. But if you look at the, this data, the gap is hard. It seems there's no dissipation, but the width is larger than the thermal burden width, and uh, so we have to find another different burden mechanism to explain why the zero bias peak height is low here. How large is the? How large is the? Uh, okay, so at time, if it's time in the Kelvin. The full width half maximum should be around 15 or less 
like to me. But how do you know that the iPhone temperature there is uh, 30 millicalories? Well, even if you choose a 50 millicalories, then yeah. it's, 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 it's still less than. In fact, it might be 100. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I, I will show you the temperature later. Factor 2 is not. And 2 is Factor 10, I mean, to make a strong argument. Factor 2, it could be just a well, I will show you the data later that we do have a long time. Okay. Uh, okay, so then uh, this aluminum seems a very good superconductor. And uh, in Delft, we also try to put aluminum on our indium and tin nanowires. And, uh, but again, uh, to grow indium tin ID MB is very difficult. And we still use these MOCVD wires. So we first grow these uh, nanowires from this uh, trenchy substrate towards each other. And then we take it out. Then we break the vacuum, and then we have the surface all size. Okay. And then uh, we bring it to MBE chamber, and uh, we use a hydrogen plasma very gently to remove the oxygen. And hydrogen plasma will react with the oxygen and form water. <coughs> and after that, we put aluminum on. And you have very thin uh, layer of aluminum on top of the medium and uh, antimony nanowires. And if you look at the interface, it's also very flat. Okay. And then once we get another wire, we try to uh, fab contact on this nanowire. So this is uh, another wire with two aluminum islands. And then we etch away this aluminum, put a normal contact here, and another normal contact here. And this normal contact is far away from this uh, tunnel barrier, so, so which we can treat this part as a, as a superconducting contact. Then we put top uh, dielectric, and then we put gate. Okay, two gates. One gate tune the chemical potential, uh, show underneath the nanowire, this super gate. Another gate tune the, uh, depletes uh, this, uh, this part and create a tunnel barrier. This is how the final device looks like. Okay, so this gate is all around gate. And this is the schematic of the device. A nanowire, uh, uh, aluminum shell, and uh, two gates here. So this is the, uh, the data we measured from this device. <laughs> Conductance as a function of bias voltage and the uh, tunnel barrier gate. And uh, if you do line cuts, you can see that uh, uh, at uh, in a very negative tunnel gate, at the very negative tunnel gate, where you almost deplete the nanowire, you resolve a hard superconducting gap. Okay? And uh, at positive tunnel gate, where you have one subband populated, where the conductance is close to three square of H, and the inside the gap, you can see the conductance getting enhanced compared to the, uh, the, the, gap, the above gap conductance. And this is due to angular reflection. So you have a electron goes in and the hole comes out. The charge gets doubled. So the conductance in principle should be doubled for the perfect case. And uh, of course, in reality, there's always a little bit tiny of disorder. And then uh, you can see, but the, the fact that you can already see this enhancement is already a very good, a good sign of the uh, body's transport here. Then if you do a, a horizontal line cut outside the superconducting gap, you can resolve a quantized uh, plateau at two square of H, which is this green curve. And then inside the gap at zero bias, you can see this uh, pink curve. And on the plateau, the constant gets enhanced. And here, it gets suppressed. Okay. And throughout the entire range, there is no uh, disorder effect, which is, I mean, can give you localization or uh, conduction resonances. There's no such uh, effect. So, it, so it's still uh, a, a ballistic, very, very good ballistic system. And then we can, uh, so this blue curve is the fit to this uh, pink curve. And this, uh, we just use a very simple formula from uh, Benneker, which was originally de derived from a BTK model, actually. So uh, BTK model basically assumes that you have a point contact in front of a superconductor, and you can tune the transmission of this quantum point contact, which is T. And the outside gap, the above gap conductance, which is normal state conductance, is performs to the transmission, T times two square of H, which is this, uh, this uh, green curve. And subgap conductance, or zero bias conductance, is 2t squared divided by 2 minus t squared. So uh, what we do is here, we at every point, every gate, we take the green curve above the conductance, and based on the conductance value, we can extract the transmission t, and we plug it into the GS, calculate what it should be, and get the blue curve. And then compare this blue curve with what we measured at zero bias, which is this uh, pink curve. And you can see from open to pin trough, they actually match it quite well. Uh, this basically means that the subgap conductance is uh, really dominated by Andrew reflection, not cross particles. So this is also another indication of a hard gap. And we can also plot this uh, in uh, GS versus GN 
from this formula, you can get the relation, which is the red curve, and this black dot is what we measured. And here we use a lo linear scale because we find that uh, if you plot in log scale, even if it doesn't fit, it may look like they fit. So, so, so log scale is really misleading. So how much is the red thing? Well, uh, based on this uh, enhancement, or uh, this uh, highest GS we can get, it's around, uh, it's above 1.5. Okay, if you plug, if you put this to be 1.5, and carry this key, the highest is uh, more than 95 percent. Yeah, more than 95. Yeah. Uh, and then this hard gap can survive until a uh, high magnetic field. So uh, if you increase magnetic field, you can see the sub gap conductance is zero and remains at zero until the bow gap of aluminum closes. Okay. So indeed, I mean, we have hard gap at zero Tesla and also hard gap at finite magnetic field. And this, fun, fun, uh, this hard gap can really pr uh, provide the topological protection for our system. And then we tune this uh, gate. Uh, okay, so this is another device actually. And this is another wire with aluminum shell here. And this two gate to the chemical potential while this two gate to the tunnel barrier. If you tune the uh, chemical potential with this two gate into the right regime, and then you apply magnetic field, you can find the gap closes and form a zero bias peak. If you do the line cut here, you can see the peak height uh, reaches the quantized value, which is uh, two e square of h. Okay. And this is a zero bias line cut. You can see, I mean, in this small uh, region, the height is stays more or less close to two e square of h. And this is a series simulation, and using the, the, the again extracting the parameters from this device, and the qualitatively agrees with uh, basically all the features. And this is series series line cut. This is experiment. You can see quantized and. Uh, uh, also, uh, the peak comes down when the gap closes. So uh, I said this uh, hard gap can give you a quantized zero bias peak because it doesn't give you dissipation burden. But if you look at the line cut at zero Tesla, which is a black curve, the gap looks soft. So sub gap conduction is not zero. And why is that? I want to point out that this is basically not, uh, not the uh, real soft gap, which is due to dissipation. It's actually simply a tunnel barrier effect. If the tunnel barrier transmission is high, then you have finite energy reflection, then of course the conductance cannot be always at zero. Actually, when the transmission is close to one, you should have enhancement into the rest of pressure here. And indeed, if you uh, tune this device into more tunnel regime, and you can go to from this uh, black curve here to this uh, orange curve, and the gap is indeed hard. Okay. So, so, and this, uh, this uh, we, we call soft, uh, fake soft gap, actually doesn't hurt the uh, quantized zero bias height. So. Excuse me. Does the voltage storage always stop at the junction uh, only? I mean, Sorry? can you always uh, ignore the voltage stop elsewhere? I, I mean, uh, in principle, what we're doing here is uh, the two probe uh, measurement, but you assume that everything happens at the contact, right? But Ever now, once you increase the transmission in principle, you could also have contribution from elsewhere. Uh, yes. OK, so then we have to go to this analysis again. So if you have this uh, inverse scorching effect on the normal contact, <coughs> then this will not hold at high transmission. <laughs> so yeah. The only way we can say is to really compare the spanning curve or BTK curve at different transmissions to, to prove that that is hard. Okay. How thick is your aluminum? Huh? How thick is your aluminum? It's less than 10 nanometers to have a uh, high enough fixity. Okay, so then the height is quantized. I, I haven't explained why the height should be quantized. Okay, so if you look at the device, uh, this quantized height actually is a very uh, easy to understand. It's basically a resonant energy reflection. So the conductance through this Marana state is by energy reflection. So you have an electron goes in and the hole comes out. And when it goes in, you see the tunnel barrier. And when you come out, you see the tunnel barrier again. And because this happens at zero bias, zero energy, so electron hole have the, the same energy and see the same barrier. So you see the same barrier twice. And in quantum dot language, it's like the coupling uh, uh, to the left lead and the right lead is the same. So this is this, uh, when you have same coupling, then the conductance is, uh, transmission is, uh, is perfect, is one. Okay, this is called the resonant uh, tunneling. And because it's energy reflection, so it's a resonant energy uh, uh, tunneling. And this is guaranteed, actually, because by particle hole symmetry. Because the barrier is always the same if you are at zero energy. So no matter what the transmission is, the height should always be quantized at two square of h. 
And then the question is that why is the Marana before not quantized? And I mentioned about the summer broadening before. And if your zero bias peak width is very narrow, narrower than the summer broadening, then after summer broadening, the height can drop. And uh, actually another uh, 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 broadening mechanism is this dissipation. And we believe we are in this case because we do have vortex and uh, our width is uh, wider than summer broadening, at, at least a factor of three. And uh, after we uh, get rid of the vortex by choosing aluminum, and uh, indeed our height reaches two square of age. So, and so th th this is our brief uh, explanation about what, I mean, intuitive explanation of what we should see. So at zero Kelvin, uh, all the height should be quantized. And the Marana peak shape should be this Lorenzian shape. And the gamma is the half of the full width half maximum. And if you look at the Marana uh, peak shape, and uh, so full width half is two gamma. And uh, if you change the coupling, the tunnel barrier coupling, you change the gamma, and you change the peak width, full width half maximum. So, but uh, no matter what the peak width is, the height is always uh, quantized at two square range. But of course, in reality, you always have finite temperature. For example, if it's 50 millikelvin, then the peak can come down. But if your uh, original peak width, which is a tunnel broaden width, is much larger than some broaden width, then which is the red curve here. So the some broaden width is very narrow. And then after this broadening, it can still stay very close to two square range, resolve a plateau. But if the uh, summer broadened width is larger than tunnel broadened width, then after uh, summer broadened, the height will drop here. But in the meantime, the peak width should be <coughs> close to uh, the summer broadened width, 3.5 kVT. Okay, so this is the criteria. And if you compare, if you look at our zero bias peak width, it's uh, wider, much wider than summer broadened width. Okay, so at least that's consistent with, uh, with this picture. Can I still continue on this discussion? Because yes. actually, when you're measuring this IV, you're actually putting a lot of power to your, to your system. Lots yes. means uh, like, I don't know, uh, pico, picowatts or, or maybe a bit less. But I mean, basically, and this has to be dissipated close to the junction. Yeah. And uh, the component coupling of, uh, of superconductors at, at, let's say, 50 millicarbon is extremely big. And this means that uh, actually you're not dissipating it into the phonons. And uh, so therefore, actually, you might be locally heating it by the measurement itself. And that, that problem is uh, the gap. OK, so, um, but it's at zero, zero bars, very close to zero bars, also tunnel strategy. No, no, but I, I just, uh, I mean, I gave the numbers of, the, I mean, uh, is this close to zero bias? So it's, it's, I don't know, uh, some uh, uh, 10 micro, micro volts or, or something like that. Yeah. And uh, with micro room volts, you would get actually 10 to 1, right? Okay. Well, I mean, one kilo ohm and a micro squared, that's 10 to watt. And now if you have 10, so then you have 100 10 to watt. Mm -hmm. and if you have 100 10 to, 10 to watt on a on superconductor uh, at 50 millik, you are not going to dissipate the point. You, you might be diffusing it away, but uh, I mean, if, if you have a small system, you might not, you might be heating the small system. Okay. Okay, I, I'll talk about temporary dependence later. Okay. Uh, so, uh, a key feature is that uh, this uh, Marana peak height should be quantized at two-score range, no matter how you tune the transmission, as long as it's much larger than thermal burden. And we use this uh, tunnel barrier gate to tune the transmission. And you can see the transmission really tuned because the outside gap, the conductance changes a lot. And, but uh, when you have zero bias peaks, the height remains roughly close to two-score range, resolves a, a plateau or a quarter plateau behavior. And uh, this is the most important feature that we observe here. So if you do several line cuts here, you can see the zero bias peak height stays at two square range, while the uh, outside gap, 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 the conductance changes. That means you are changing the transmission and the height doesn't change much. And here you see the zero bias peak gets splitted. And that's actually because the, uh, we think it's because of this marana's overlap with this marana by this tunnel gate. Because when you, deplete this part, use the tunnel gate more, then you push this Maranas away from tunnel barrier, and then it can overlap with the, the remote Maranas. If you look at the, the device length, it's only one micron, and the Marana wave function size is around uh, 300 nanometers or more. So this length is only three or two times longer than the Marana wave function size. So it's very easy to, uh, to overlap and split. And uh, here is the, statistic, uh, the analysis from this red curves. This is a peak height, roughly stays at quantized value, while peak width uh, is increasing 
if you change this, uh, this connectance here, the above gas connectance. And CRD simulation and quality captures all the signatures here. So the quantized uh, zero bias peak, and then if you change the uh, transmission, the peak height roughly stays at 2 square inch. What's the difference between the red and the gray in the middle of D? This. Uh, oh, this D, is. D, D, D. 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 Red and uh, black. Yeah, what's the difference? Oh, this black is uh, split peak. <coughs> and red is uh, zero bias peak, which stays at common What are you doing together from one second? From top to bottom, I'm going from here to here. Yeah, change the transmission automatically. And you can see the transmission also decreases. So. Okay. Uh, and this plateau can be reproduced in another de uh, device. So you can see uh, this is a fixed magnet field, 0.83 Tesla. If you increase the tunnel barrier gate, increase transmission, the, uh, the uh, above gap constants keep changes while the uh, zero bias conductance resolve a plateau around three square inch during the increasing. And uh, here, the zero bias peak's height exceeds three square inch. And we think is that, I mean, in reality, if you keep increasing the tunnel gate voltage, of course, the conductance will inevitably increase above three square inch because you have uh, more and more subband populated. Uh, that subband can give you a background. And then, but the net height should stay at three square inch. But uh, we don't know the background. So we cannot uh, have an accurate estimate of the net height. But the net height is always less than 2 square inch. I mean, if you roughly estimate where it should be. And in this region, if you look at the uh, above gap conductance, it's actually larger than E square inch. So that means that we definitely have more than one channel populated. So that's also sort of justify our, uh, our uh, hypothesis here. And then uh, if you increase math theory, you can see this zero bias peak uh, line shape fits very well with the Lorentzian shape. This Lorentzian shape is this, uh, this blue curve. Okay. And, uh, but this actually doesn't uh, mean much because uh, advances also give you a very good, uh, equally well-fitted Lorentzian curve, which I will show later. And the temperature dependence. So when you increase temperature, you can see around 0.5 Kelvin, zero bias peak gets split, gets worse out. And this is simulation. Okay. So this simulation is basically uh, uh, very simple. I took this uh, the, the base temperature curve, the IDV curve, as the input and then assume it's a zero temperature, and then do the uh, convolution integration with uh, the duality of Fermi function to calculate at different temperature. And they, quite, they fit actually quite well. Uh, that's, that's all, uh, all this uh, zero bias peak data. And uh, okay, now uh, in the first, last part, I'll talk about, uh, briefly talk about the Andrew bond state. Uh, because Andrew bond state can also give you a quantized zero bias peak height. And how do we differentiate them experimentally? Uh, Andrew Bonsai was uh, first uh, studied uh, by uh, uh, Silvano de Francesco's group. And so they have a N quantum dot S system. And then you have a localized uh, state becomes Andrew Bonsai. If you apply that field, it split and for, uh, merge as zero and form a very stable zero bias peak here. Okay. And uh, ideally it should be a crossing, but uh, you have this, uh, this gap closing pushes all the states towards zero. And also this three orbit interaction, which give you a lot of anti-crossing. Uh, that can actually make the zero bias peak stay a little bit longer in, in Zeeman energy. So mimic the mana signature. Uh, this is very difficult to rule out. And initially we think, okay, since this is because of disorder, let's just get rid of all the disorder and have all these ballistic effects, no quantum dots, there are no localized states, no energy bond states. Uh, but again, we run into this uh, uh, problem of the dissipation. But it turns out later that even if you don't have quantum dots, if you have potential fluctuations due to this case, that can still give you localized states and uh, give you sort of this kind of uh, energy bond state. So this is the uh, theory work from uh, Dasama's group. And they actually simulate this case in a, dis in a ballistic nanowire. And you uh, use gate, you can create a small local potential fluctuation. And this is what they call a quantum dot. And then if you study the state in a quantum dot, and you can see it form an energy bond state. And if you increase the amount of energy, you can form a very stable zero bias peak. If you change the chemical potential here, and uh, the zero bias peak can also be very stable. But they, all these zero bias peaks are, are trivial zero bias peaks. They are due to Andrew Bond state. And uh, they use this basically to provide a different, uh, another alternative uh, compared to the Copenhagen work. Uh, so the main observation of Copenhagen work is that if you increase the magnetic field, you find a very stable zero bias peak. If you change the chemical potential, you find that the zero bias peak is also stable. And here, uh, Zeeman and chemical potential. So they look quite similar, actually. How do we differentiate them? 
the, the first thing to differentiate is uh, by this uh, tunnel gate uh, stability test. That's what we call. So if you have an energy bound state, the energy bound state is localized near the tunnel barrier. And if you tune the tunnel barrier gate, then you are changing the potential there a lot. Then you can change the energy. So that means this energy bound state energy cannot be stable at zero. And if you tune the gate, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not a sort of stable zero bound state. So it quickly gets split by the tunnel gate. While for Marana case, if you turn the tunnel barrier gate, nothing happens. You, you always have a very, very stable zero bound speed. And actually, in our uh, uh, old system, we observed that uh, or any zero bound speed we find is very stable if you tune this, uh, this gate here. Okay. But in our new system, what we found is that if you tune this gate, we do have some trivial zero bound speeds. And these zero bound speeds are indeed not stable if you tune uh, this tunnel barrier gate. So you can see it's only a level, it's, it's a simply a level crossing. So this is basically definitely not the Maranas because this, this means that if your tunnel barrier gate can affect this level, it's probably some level near the tunnel barrier, which is energy bound state. And for our Marana case, it's, uh, it's quite stable if you tune this uh, tunnel barrier gate. It's not a level crossing here compared to this one. Okay. And another thing to differentiate is this uh, plateau behavior because uh, this is a work by uh, Benicar's group in, in, uh, a few years ago. So they studied this uh, QPC in front of a nanowire, a Marana nanowire, and then they tune the transmission of the QPC. So I covered this part because this part corresponds to the multiband regime. If you look at a single band, then uh, the Marana give you a plateau at twist curvature, which is a red curve, while the uh, AB energy bound states give you a conductance at foist curvature for the perfect case. But if you have a little bit of residue disorder, this uh, trivial case quickly, quickly de get destroyed. Okay? So the, if it's energy bound state, the conductance can be anywhere between zero and uh, four square range. But the Marana still stays at contact at three square range. And indeed, we observe for our trivial uh, zero bias peak, which is uh, just a level crossing, the height, if you look at the zero bias peak height, it can continuously changing from uh, below three square range to above three square range. And it doesn't resolve a plateau, it's not stable at three square range if you tune the gate. And if you tune mana field, you can say it can happen at three square range, but this is just by accident, but also much lower or higher than three square range. So this is the typical fingerprint of Andrew Bond state. Uh, while for Marana, it's, I mean, it sta it's stays stable at the uh, three score range for quite some large uh, gate, gate parameter range. Okay, so a summary of this uh, ABS versus uh, uh, Marana zero bias peak. So Andrew Bond state is not stable if you change the potential near the tunnel barrier. And uh, ABS is not quantized at three score range. It might be, happen to be at three score range, but it's not quantized, not stable. And uh, also the anti-crossing. So in this Copenhagen work, if the level comes down, then zero bias peak becomes split peak, and they use this as a, a evidence of the correlation of Maranas. Uh, but if you look at the simulations, uh, if it's really well separated Maranas, then no matter what levels comes down, you always stay at zero bias. So it's always a very stable zero bias peak for Maranas. And uh, we also have energy bound state, and uh, energy bound state also give you a lot of anti-crossing here. And so it's hard to differentiate uh, this case from this case. So the best way is to observe a very stable zero bias because no matter what level it comes down. So, and then the conclusion is that very good well separated Marana should not give you anti-crossing for this system. And finally, we get to the temperature dependence. Okay? Uh, and also this is the last part. I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so this is what we have. The black curve is what we measured and the red curve is a theory. If you look at it, it actually fits quite well from different temperatures, 70 millikelvin all the way towards 600 millikelvin. And what we did is very simple. We took this uh, uh, 20 millikelvin data as a zero tem temperature data, and then do Fermi convolution, from uh, from zero to convolution. And uh, we find that it actually fits very well here. So actually this also suggests that, because this model only uh, applies if your real temperature is much less than temperature you simulated. For example, if my election temperature is 15 millikelvin, and I treat that as zero temperature, and then I do the Fermi convolution, then at 70 millikelvin, it probably doesn't fit because they are too close. So this also suggests that uh, we observe that this uh, good agreement between experiment and data applies very well when the temperature is above 50 millikelvin. So this actually suggests that our true election temperature at 20 millikelvin is probably much less than 50 millikelvin. So that's why I believe our election temperature is not so, so large for that case. Of course, we did a lot of uh, filtering work in the fridge. That's, that's a lot of work to try to reduce the election temperature. So uh, this good uh, temperature dependence really doesn't prove anything because all it proves is uh, this formula, the convolution formula. 
And all this shows, all, all this assumes is that you have a perfect Fermi liquid of your normal metal contact, which follow the Fermi di uh, distribution. Okay. And uh, if actually for this trivial uh, zero bias peak case, if the zero bias peak height happens to be at contact value, and if you do the temperature dependence, you will get exactly the same temperature dependence as if it's a Marana case. So temperature dependence should not be a, a big deal. For, I mean, it's, it's just a Fermi convolution. Okay. Uh, so that's all the, uh, okay, so la really the last part. A very brief summary between ABS and Maranas. So for Andrea bound states, you have a potential fluctuation here, and you have a localized state. So this Andrea bound state can be considered as two heavily overlapped Maranas. So this uh, yellow and this blue curve, they are heavily overlapped. While for Marana case, they are very well separated, spatially separated. And for, for this uh, Andrea bound state, because they are very close to the tunnel barrier, if you change the potential here, I mean, the energy also changes. You don't have a very stable zero bias peak. While for Marana's, it's always a, a zero bias kind of peak. And for energy bound states, the conductance is not quantized. It can be anywhere between zero and four h And uh, two square h is just by accident. While for, uh, for Marana's, it's, a, it's more or less quantized at uh, two square h Okay, I will skip the last part and come to the conclusion. So, uh, the conclusion is that there are trivial zero bias peaks in our nanowires for sure. And uh, there are experimental ways to differentiate this uh, trivial zero bias peak from this non trivial zero bias peak, we believe. And we have zero bias peaks in both our uh, old system, Navi Tanar system, and also new system, which we uh, can rule out this uh, energy bound state with a uh, very high confidence. And we don't know any other trivial alternative which can explain our data. And uh, in the meantime, it fits very well to the Mahana picture. Thank you very much. <laughs>